thank you all for coming out and for everyone else for, for tuning in um, that are attending virtually. I'd like to just before I start, um, thank Dr. Cho for laying down an outstanding foundation for my talk and especially uh, call out uh, Stephen for that very, very eloquent um, and heartfelt uh, talk that he gave. I think it was very important and uh, I think if you remember nothing else from today, um, I think that the take home messages that Stephen gave us on um, a number of different fronts are really, really important. So Stephen, thank you again, it's, it's a privilege. Um, as Brian mentioned, I've been involved with CRI and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for their leadership um, for, of the field and for um, the, the pioneering basic science that has really led us to where we are today with, with immunotherapies. And so I'm gonna talk to you uh, mainly about what's been termed checkpoint blockade and Dr. Cho um, described some of this and get into a little bit more of the, the nitty gritty clinical detail of you know, how it works and what one can expect. And I'll, I'll also thank Brian and Emily um, for, on your behalf, editing out the disgusting photos of the inside of people's intestines um, from, from my slides. I think we'll, we'll all um, have a better lunch because of that. Um, as many of you are, are very aware, um, there are several different, very common modalities of treating cancer. Surgery, chemotherapy, targeted pathway inhibitors, these new targeted therapies that block the intracellular circuits that make cancer cells divide, and radiation therapy. And until the last few years, immunotherapy was um, sort of a non-conventional approach to cancer treatment, but we now know that immunotherapy is in fact now um, an additional pillar of standard cancer treatment, and we're very grateful for that. Um, the reason that it's in red is not just because we love it a lot, um, but also because it approaches the cancer problem from a different direction. Um, it's treating the patient rather than the tumor. Um, because with immunotherapy, we are getting the body's own immune cells and organs activated, and that in turn is what kills the cancer or controls the cancer, as opposed to all those other modalities which have been responsible for a significant amount of success over the past 50 or 60 years, which are all targeted um, on the tumor. And there may be uh, a future where we are bringing these strategies together in combinations, as was alluded to by some of the last questions that we heard. Now, um, as I mentioned, our field was really considered a little bit outside um, the norm, outside conventional uh, cancer medicine until 2013, when Science, which is the most, one of the most eminent um, scientific publications, named cancer immunotherapy the breakthrough of the year. Um, and I think all of us at CRI, elsewhere, who um, are in the field of immunotherapy finally felt somewhat validated by this. Um, and of course, there's been a lot in the news about immunotherapy um, in the past few years, and it would almost make one think that this was a new idea. But in fact, it was not a new idea. In fact, it can trace its roots to 1891, or even earlier, and um, 1891, important on a number of fronts. First of all, if you remember Dr. Naismith and his peach basket, um, we, we have him to thank. But we also have Dr. Coley, um, who, uh, as uh, Dr. O'Donnell Tormey uh, referred to, uh, you know, Dr. Coley was a physician here in New York City who was really widely considered the parent figure of immunotherapy by noting that patients who developed infections after cancer surgery seemed to live longer, and his vision that that did something to the internal resistance to cancer. Um, that uh, led to patients living longer. Now, we didn't know from the immune system in the late 19th century, so this was all considered speculation, and some people actually considered it quackery in the mid-20th century. Thankfully now, it's the breakthrough of the year um, and no longer quackery. 
Um, and in fact, um, I, as a uh, proud employee of Memorial Sloan Kettering, could feel very validated when my institution chose to focus its latest advertising campaign on immunotherapy. And I think, you know, as, a, um, as an employee of an academic medical center, you know when you've really made it when your institution advertises your work on the side of a New York City bus. So I, th I think we're, we're clearly in the area of success. So as, as Brian mentioned to you, my clinical activities are mainly focused on melanoma, but what I'd like to share with you is what we've learned in melanoma, we have thankfully been able to apply to other more common diseases, as you've heard about earlier this morning. Um, my, my research clinically has been focused on um, several different um, immune uh, therapy um, medicines, one of them ipilimumab, uh, another pembrolizumab, another one nivolumab. Pembrolizumab and nivolumab target the same molecule, the PD-1 molecule. You're going to hear a lot about this PD-1 in a moment. Now, in, in explaining uh, this whole field to patients and families, and in fact some colleagues who um, have not thought about immunotherapy um, before the past few years, it's often helpful to consider the generation of immune response like starting your car. That there isn't just one thing that you have to do to get an immune response against cancer um, up and running. And in the same way that you can't just do one thing to start your car and have a safe ride. You need to have a very specific lock and key interaction with the ignition switch. Okay, I know that these are old slides because nobody uses keys anymore. We all have those little fobs, right? But give me a little poetic license. Um, you know, you have to have this very uh, you know, specific lock and key interaction, and that is the T-cell's receptor, as Dr. Cho showed you, recognizing the target antigen on the cancer cell. Then you have to have a foot on the gas, and that is the interaction between a molecule called CD28 on the T-cell um, and a molecule on another immune cell called B7. But we all know what happens if you have a car with its ignition key turned and a foot on the gas, but no foot on the brake. Um, you, you know, you're going to crash. And that's exactly what will happen to an immune system without breaks. And many of the molecules that you hear and read about um, in the news from your physicians and nurses are medicines that largely block the breaks, that keep the immune system from going too quickly and reacting to normal body parts and causing autoimmune diseases. So what we're doing is we are exploiting all of the basic science knowledge that has been gained over the past 30 or 40 years to understand what turns the immune system on, what turns it off, and how can we tweak that to get the immune system to recognize cancer. And then finally, it would be great if you could steer this now accelerating car toward a target of interest, and that is the idea behind cancer vaccines. So one of the uh, things that we need to keep in mind as we begin to think about um, immunotherapy and the way in which patients can respond to immunotherapy is that it may not happen very quickly. It may happen in kind of a slow, even delayed fashion. And this is very different from uh, more cytotoxic uh, therapies that directly affect tumors. Um, because again, we're not doing anything directly to the tumor with immunotherapy. We're, we're working on the immune system, and then the immune system has to work on the tumor. So this is uh, a series of CAT scans from a patient of mine um, who was treated for metastatic melanoma. Um, and uh, I'll just give you a little bit of radiology lesson here. So anybody who's had a CAT scan will know that you lie down on the table, right? And so this is the table right here. And a CAT scan is a series of, of x-rays. Um, um, and these are taken um, about every five millimeters. Um, and so if you imagine that this is the patient, their head is behind the screen, their legs are sticking out in front of you, and um, this is a, uh, an x-ray through the center of the body, and this big gray organ um, is the liver. And so a normal liver without metastases would look kind of like this or like this, but you can see that there are all these unpleasant looking dots which represent uh, cancer that has spread to the liver. And um, this scan was actually done 12 weeks after a patient started on 
uh, anti-CTLA-4 or ipilimumab. And this patient, at the end of treatment, uh, the scan looked like the cancer was getting worse, but in fact, the patient felt a whole lot better. Um, and so what we noticed was that sometimes the imaging can lag behind um, the actual response that the patient is having to the treatment. And so without any additional therapy, you can see that the patient started to get better and then continued to get better and actually had a remission that lasted nine years. Um, and so we have begun to think about immunotherapy in, in a different way, that just because you do a scan in four or six weeks after you start immunotherapy, there is not 100% certainty that if that scan looks like things are moving in the wrong direction, um, that that means that the treatment is not working. Sometimes um, for this medicine, for ipilimumab, it's up to 15% of the time, uh, people can have scans that look worse, but they will eventually get better. With the other medicines that block PD-1, such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, um, these medicines, uh, it's a smaller percentage of people who have this sort of false progression. It's probably around 5 or 10%, but it still happens. So it's very important that when you are visiting with your oncology team, that if you feel better, you tell them that. Because how you feel is actually just as or more important than what the pictures show. Okay, that's, that's very important for us to know. Now, um, Dr. Cho alluded to side effects, and this is also very important because the side effects from immunotherapy are very different than those that accompany other forms of anti-cancer therapy. So for um, the CTLA-4 blocking uh, drugs and ipilimumab, which is... Um, approved to treat melanoma um, is the, the best known of those. There are others in clinical trials. Um, these are really the most common side effects, rash, diarrhea, hepatitis, and um, dysfunction of some of the endocrine glands. And the endocrine glands that most often get affected are the thyroid um, and the pituitary gland. Um, and about a quarter of people will have what are termed grade three or four adverse events, meaning that these are serious and require treatment. So about a quarter of people will have these events. And um, we're very good now at managing them, um, but we're, we're only as good as our communication is. So, you know, the, the one of these side effects that is the most worrisome to me as a clinician whoop, is, um, oh boy, uh, is this one, um, the diarrhea. Because in the early clinical trials, um, this medicine actually caused diarrhea that got so bad that people had perforations or holes that formed in their intestines. And um, we now know how to manage that with steroids. And now that happens much less often. Um, so we tell people from day one that if you're gonna go on an immunotherapy like this, um, you need to recognize that the doctors and nurses who are taking care of you are more interested in your bowel habits than you could ever imagine. So there is no room for modesty, okay? Um, and so, um, but we also know that if people for some reason feel like I don't want to tell my doctor or my nurse like how often I go to the bathroom or I'm scared that if I tell them that I'm having the side effect that they're going to take me off the treatment. Um, that is how we all get ourselves in trouble. Um, because some people need only a little bit of this treatment, some people need a lot of this treatment, it's not one size fits all. In cancer medicine, we're, we're often thinking about the more is better approach. But uh, for immunotherapy, the best dose is what an individual person can tolerate. So um, never be afraid to share information about side effects. And I'll show you why in, in a few moments. So um, as opposed to CTLA-4, for the anti-PD-1 medicines, uh, the approved ones, I'll name them again, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, um, and many others in development, fatigue is the most common side effect, about 40% of people. Some people can have rash, some people can have achy joints. Now you might say, well, gee, Jed, these side effects sound an awful lot like autoimmune disease. 
right? Like the immune cells attacking normal body parts, the skin, the liver, the intestines, um, endocrine organs, and that's in fact what's happening. We all, as human beings, have in our bodies immune cells called T cells that recognize normal body parts. They're usually present at very small numbers, and they're usually kept in check. When we mess with your immune system by giving you one of these medicines, those cells become more frequent and they can rise to the point where they produce these side effects. The good news is that we're able to take care of these side effects without getting in the way of the anti-cancer activity. And um, that is what is in this slide here, which basically shows some work from um, my colleague Paul Chapman uh, at Memorial that people who are treated for some of the side effects of ipilimumab um, and who get steroids for that, and steroids are highly immune suppressing medicines, do just as well in terms of long-term survival as patients who did not receive steroids. So you never have to be afraid that just because the doctor or nurse says you have to stop the immune therapy uh, because of a side effect or because you have to go on a steroid, that that means that the medicine is not going to work for you. Um, again, the job of these medicines is to activate your immune system. And if you've gotten a side effect, then the job is done. Okay, so one problem that we confront is that immune checkpoint inhibitors don't work in every patient. And we are working hard every day to better understand this. Um, and, and so the question is, how do we increase the number of patients who do benefit? Because if you look at the, um, the numbers for, for patients who have responses, who have significant shrinking of, of the cancer from either CTLA-4 blockade alone or PD-1 blockade alone, for most common cancers, that's about 30 or 40 percent at most of people. Um, in, in the instance of things like what Stephen discussed, MSI high related cancers or Lynch syndrome, it's much higher because the immune system is much more jazzed up uh, at baseline. And so it's, it's going to have a higher response rate. But we've been thinking every day about how we can increase those numbers so that more people benefit. And so we believe the answer is actually in combinations. And it's not just combinations of immune therapies with other immune therapies, but it's immune therapies with chemotherapy therapy, with medicines that block blood vessels, with hormone therapies, with targeted therapies, and with other immune therapies, as well as with radiation therapy, which is a great uh, focus of uh, several people's research. Um, so I'll just give you an idea, though, that um, when we combine these immune therapy medicines together, um, we can have extraordinary results. Um, it, melanoma, for example, 60% of people treated with the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab for melanoma will have a major response. Um, so for the first time, it's really the majority of people who are having um, a decrease in size of the cancer, which appears to be durable in the majority of people. Um, but we also see more side effects. So we have to always be cautious here. And in fact, the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, 55% of people will have a high-grade side effect. And in fact, almost a third of people will have to stop treatment because of side effects. Now here's another example of why stopping treatment isn't necessarily bad. Because down here at the bottom, um, there's some data that shows that 68% of people who had to stop treatment because of a side effect actually had a major response. So that number, 68%, is higher than the overall response rate of 60%. So having to stop because of a side effect, you actually do a little bit better than if you don't have to stop. So again, more evidence that this is not a one-size-fits-all, that there isn't an optimal dose uh, or number of doses that people have to receive. So we wish there were a test that existed to see who would be a good candidate to receive immunotherapy. Um, Stephen described very eloquently um, MSI testing of tumors, which is a way to see whether the autocorrect mechanism that keeps our genome safe is working, and that's a very, very reasonable thing to do. Um, you know, if you have some uh, tumors that are 
commonly found in, in Lynch syndrome. Um, but we also need to think about tumors that are found in people who don't have genetic syndromes and what might we learn about predicting response. And um, the simple answer is, um, this is the field called biomarkers. Um, and uh, is there a biomarker that we can use today that with 100% accuracy can tell us who is gonna respond to immunotherapy? The, the, the answer is not yet. We are working on that, we are making progress, but as of today, um, across the board, we do not have a biomarker that tells us with 100% accuracy who is gonna to respond to immunotherapy. However, we have heard a lot about, and you may have heard about this from your oncologist or from your own research, that there is a protein called PDL1. Uh, and it is the cloaking mechanism that a tumor can put up around itself to shield itself from the immune system. And it turns out that tumors that have a lot of this PDL1 protein on them are more likely to respond to immunotherapy than tumors who don't have a lot of this PDL1 protein. The problem is it's not perfect. It, it's not 100% accurate. And so I would not yet make a decision, for example, in a, in a melanoma patient about whether to use immunotherapy based upon PDL1. Um, status, because even in patients whose tumors are scored negative for PDL1, no detectable expression, there is still a low but documented number of people who respond to PDL1, and we don't want to prevent access um, to potentially life saving medicines based upon an imperfect biomarker. It is an enrichment factor. We, we can tell someone that if your tumor does or doesn't have a lot of PDL1 that you're less or more likely to respond, but it's not binary. It's not yes or no. And so this is really the, the, the lingo to put this in. I think people who have common cancers like lung cancer talk about EGFR, which is a protein that determines whether or not some medicines will work or not. Or melanoma patients often talk about whether the tumor has a BRAF mutation. Or breast cancer patients talk about expression of HER2 or estrogen receptor. These are all genomic markers. They are genes that are either overexpressed or, have, or that have gone wrong and are driving the cancer cells to proliferate, and the medicines that are used to respond to those markers are critically dependent on them being abnormal, abnormally high or not. And that is hardwired into the cancer cell. The PDL1 can be turned on or turned off. It can be present in some tumors in the same patient and not present in others. It's, it's um, not static. It's dynamic and it's heterogeneous and it's unpredictable. So PDL1 is just not as good um, a discriminator uh, of tumors that will respond as some of these other markers are that are used for other kinds of cancer therapy. So let's look ahead. What are the biggest questions that need to be answered and how do we answer these questions? So the, the biggest questions really are, again, who responds to immunotherapy and how do we increase the numbers of people who respond um, so that they become higher? Um, what is the optimal combination of treatments from all of those different categories for an individual patient? This is a really hard job, but we are working on it. And what it's probably going to take is an introduction of what has been termed by President Obama, um, a precision medicine approach into immunotherapy. We need to be able to interrogate the relationship between a patient's immune system and their tumor on an individual basis, and ideally have that information within a few days or weeks for you. Um, so that we can determine what combination of treatments are needed. We're just beginning to set out the roadmap now for the things that we would look for in a perfect world. And in fact, part of um, the, the Moonshot program um, that is being put forward is designed around creating an atlas of things that we would like to learn about 
individual patients' tumors and their immune system so that we can introduce that precision. But it is research, pure and simple. Um, and your participation in clinical trials um, has gotten us where we are today and will help us to get even further. And that just leads me to my last point, which is the one thing you should know about immunotherapy is that we owe any success that we have right now to research. We owe it to the basic science researchers and organizations like CRI that supported that basic science research over many decades. Um, and we owe it to the courageous patients who participated in the early clinical trials of those medicines which are now FDA approved and available to us. And the way that we're going to make more progress is with more trials. So you heard that CRI has a clinical trials network, which I'm very privileged to help lead. Um, we believe that the, the answers that are necessary in the future are going to come not only from the laboratory, not only from the clinic, but from a dynamic interplay between those two areas. And we're really grateful for you being here. Thanks very much again. voice and <laughs> yes good morning good morning do patient with breast cancer benefit from clinical trials so yes I think um, patients with breast cancer can um, certainly participate in clinical trials and there are some kinds of breast cancer such as triple negative breast cancer um, which uh, are showing themselves to be responsive to immunotherapy. So breast cancer is a disease where the standard treatments have been very, very successful for many people, but not for all people. And so I think if a breast cancer patient finds themselves in a situation where the standard uh, treatment options are um, either not working or not satisfactory, then a discussion of clinical trials is very, very reasonable with, with their oncologist. One more question. Yeah. How do I get in touch with you? How do you get in touch with me? <laughs> I, I don't mean to touch you physically, but... So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> How does she what? Okay. How do I contact your office? So um, I think if you, if, if you have breast, so I don't normally treat breast cancer patients. I treat mainly melanoma. Um, but if you wanted to see uh, an oncologist in our breast cancer team, um, I will give you the phone number for patient access at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they will link you up with a specialist in breast cancer. Yes. Oh, well, who's got the microphone? I'm trying to play by the rules here. Hi. Yes, okay. Um, has an immunotherapy patient relapsed or had a secondary cancer? And if so, how is that treated? So when you mean, when you mean a secondary cancer, like a different kind of cancer or a recurrence of the first one that's been treated? Either or. Okay, so that would mean both. Uh, uh, so yes and yes. Um, so uh, although most responses to immunotherapy are durable, meaning that they continue for years. There have been some people who have had recurrence of the cancer that originally responded to immunotherapy. And sometimes we can uh, restore that response um, by just repeating that same immunotherapy. Sometimes it takes addition of other medicines. Um, and yes, we have had some patients, for example, who've been treated for melanoma um, successfully with immunotherapy who happened to have another cancer at the same time um, and that didn't respond to immunotherapy. So there are subtle differences between individual kinds of cancer and their relationship with the immune system even in the same patient. <laughs>